class of the modern physics program today we're going to uh, talk about a very important application of quantum mechanics and that is the use of quantum mechanics to describe the formation and the life cycle of stars so the beautiful thing is that it's the Pauli exclusion principle that is determining the energy of electrons in a metal in a semiconductor or an insulator and it's the same Pauli exclusion principle that is determining the structure of matter as a whole that is the universe the cosmos so it's one simple principle the Pauli exclusion principle that describes how metals conduct electricity how semiconductors work as they are how diodes function, how the whole periodic table is constructed. You would only need, in addition to a few other things, the Pauli exclusion principle to construct the periodic table. So that is the most remarkable success of Pauli exclusion principle. And on the macrocosmic scale, on the scale of the universe, it's the same principle that is governing the structure of matter as a whole, the structure of stars. And stars are very strange objects. First of all, they are very simple, compositionally. 90% of the universe is hydrogen. And most of the mass of the universe is present in stars. About 9.9% .9 of the universe is, or of stars, is helium. And the remaining 0.1% they are the trace elements with atomic numbers higher than helium but these stars are where elements are produced stars are the nurseries of all kinds of elements so in a sense if our human bodies they are made up of phosphorus calcium hydrogen oxygen those atoms must have originated in some star somewhere therefore we have a stellar existence in this sense that is our bodies, our compositions, comprises elements that have been made, that have been cooked up in the inferno of some star. So this is something that we're going to look at today. And again, we'll just use the Pauli exclusion principle and simple mechanics to look at the life cycle of stars. So it's going to be a very interesting lecture. So, <clears throat> let me start off by mentioning that suppose we have some star and this star is predominantly hydrogen elemental hydrogen since the temperature is very high the star is radiating energy it is luminous that's the difference between a star and planet it's radiating energy and the radiation the in emitted intensity is given by the Boltzmann law sigma t4 where the emissivity is assumed to be 1 so this is the energy emitted per unit area per unit time so this energy is now going into the universe but the star is really a massive object it has a mass capital M so whenever there is mass there is a gravitational potential there's a gravitational force that is acting on the star now how is the star formed in the first place how much she said how is the star formed in the first place you have a central mass and outside this mass you have a lot of dust stellar dust and this stellar dust is being attracted towards the central mass because of gravity. So higher the mass of the star, higher will be the force of gravity. And this force of gravity helps coalesce or condense the stellar matter into the form of a spherical ball that we call a star. So the direction of gravity, as you can see, is inwards. This is the force of gravity. It's trying to shrink the star. And when the 
force of gravity tries to shrink the star, what happens is that the gravitational potential energy goes down. Right? Because of gravity. If you have a stellar, a, a speck of dust that is far away from, the, from this mass, it has zero potential energy. But when it falls into the star, its potential energy lowers. Gravity would like to attract that speck of dust. So as matter flows into the star, the potential, the gravitational potential energy drops. It decreases. As the potential energy decreases, the kinetic energy of the matter that makes up the star increases. And when the kinetic energy increases, the temperature increases. And if there is fuel inside the star, that fuel is basically hydrogen. The hydrogen atoms which are protons, they are burning. They fuse to form helium nuclei and produce large amounts of energy. So if the temperature goes up, this fusion reaction can take place. This thermonuclear reaction can take place and a fire rages inside the heart of the star. When this fire rages, it produces an outward pressure. So there is a, a pressure because of the burning fuel that is opposing the force of gravity. So gravity is acting inwards whereas the nuclear reactions that are taking place inside the star they are acting outwards. So there are two competing forces and the life of a star is a constant struggle. It's a constant battle, an ongoing war between an inward contractive force and an outward expansive force. It's a constant struggle. Inki baham kashmakash jari hai har vakt. But what happens when the hydrogen burns out? See, there are large numbers of reactions that take place in, on side on on stars. The most important of them is the proton cycle. The proton cycle mentions that hydrogen atoms, they fuse together to form helium nuclei. And in the process they create gamma rays and they cre create neutrinos and they release a large amount of energy 25 mega electron volts so whenever six protons they fuse together they form four helium nuclei two protons two gamma ray photons two neutrinos and a large amount of energy so this is the simplest reaction that takes place on the surface of or in the interior of a star now what happens when all the hydrogen is burnt out? Well the fuel disappears. When the fuel disappears, there is no outward pressure due to the burning fuel. But gravity is constantly present. What would happen there? So one would expect that the star would shrink. And what's the limit to its shrinking? Would it shrink forever? So when the star shrinks, its radius decreases. And when its radius decreases, the density must go up. Agreed? So is there anything that is stopping the continual shrinking of the star after the fuel has burned out? What do you expect to happen? So eventually the student remarks that the density must approach infinity. Bolo? Why? How does it produce heat energy? It doesn't. There's no thermal energy. There's no burning of fuel. So one question, one remark was that the density must go up to infinity and a black hole must be formed. But if you look out in the universe, if you do observational astronomy, there are large number of objects 
which are in fact corpses of stars sitaron ki lashein theek hai ek sitara puri aap ho to aapke sath chamakta hai apna fuel apna eendhan wo jalata hai theek hai roshni deta hai jis tarah suraj aajkal hame roshni de raha hai it's warming our earth eventually when the fuel burns out something will happen that this outward pressure of the burning fuel will cease to exist and only the inward gravitational force exists what happens then the gravity would shrink the star but there's a limit and a new object is formed in in the universe which is called a white dwarf and a white dwarf in fact prevents further shrinking and there has to be some outward force or an outward pressure that is stopping gravity where is that outward pressure coming from can anyone give a give a hint ji the repulsion between electrons between atoms why is the repulsion between atoms no but the star as a whole is electrically neutral the star remember the sun is the sun a charged object or is it neutral it's neutral it's a plasma which has electrons and protons but equal in concentration the star as a whole is neutral anyone from the back is there any outward pressure that can prevent the onslaught of gravity anyone from there anyone please raise your hands do you understand my question yes yes you do any idea what can prevent the continual or onslaught of gravity gravitational forces of other planets but the other planets or let me talk about stars stars they are so far away they are hundreds of millions of lights in light years away they cannot affect the stars the helium might convert into lithium or some higher elements well that's a very good answer that new nuclear reactions can start the helium can burn into lithium the lithium can burn into beryllium boron all the higher elements up to iron can be formed so new thermonuclear reactions can take place and when those new reactions take place an outward and exothermic reactions take place again the gravity the onslaught of gravity can be stopped but before those reactions take place there is yet another force that is preventing gravity stars might have a rocking force which might stop it from shrinking close stars might have rocky cores but what is preventing the shrinking of the rocky core because gravity always exists Okay, I give you a hint. It's the Pauli exclusion principle. Because as you as you remember, the Fermi energy of electrons, E F, an expression that we derive for metals, is given by h bar squared two times the mass of the electron, three pi square, n e, two by three. This is the Fermi energy of electrons in a metal. So, what is N E here? N E का क्या मतलब? This is the number of electrons, total number of electrons per volume. So, this is the concentration of electrons, the density of electrons. So, as this number goes up, that is, you are shrinking the star. the fermi energy of the electrons is going up and the fermi energy of the electrons is going up would mean that electrons would resist coming close to one another because of the uncertainty principle because we've already seen that electrons are fermions they cannot exist in the same quantum state and because of this they would have somewhat of a repulsion from one another an outward force that is what you are doing the gravity is trying to decrease the energy but as the star is shrinking this electron density is going up the electron density is going up the electronic energy is going up and this electronic energy is 
increasing which means it produces an outward pressure you see the poly exclusion principle can be considered to be a kind of repulsion although not a repulsion in the usual sense of the word but a repulsion because two electrons cannot in this cannot exist in the same quantum state they cannot share the same quantum state which means because of this poly exclusion principle the energy of electrons in metals is very high as compared to a gas of electrons so this Fermi energy presents an outward acting force, an outward acting pressure which resists gravity. Therefore, there is a constant struggle. Suppose the hydrogen has burnt out all, the star has burnt out all its hydrogen. So there is an inward pressure due to gravity. And there is, on the same time, an outward pressure. acting due to the electrons and this pressure is called the degeneracy pressure and it is the Pauli exclusion principle that is responsible for this outward degeneracy pressure it is the Pauli exclusion principle that tells us that matter is not infinitely compressible you cannot compress matter because if you start compressing matter, the energy associated with the electrons goes so high that you get an unstable system and there is a limit to how much you can compress matter. So now there are two competing forces, the force of gravity that is acting inwards and the degeneracy pressure that is acting downwards and the origin of this pressure is the Pauli exclusion principle. So when a star has burnt out all its fuel, it starts shrinking and when it starts shrinking because of gravity there's a limit to the radius that this that this stellar corpse can achieve there is a limit and how do we calculate that limit what we really have to do we have to calculate the gravitational potential energy and the electronic potential energy so how do we calculate the electronic potential energy first of all I would like to calculate the average energy of the electrons. So can't we explain the same phenomena by uncertainty? Yes, we can. Alright, so this is the Fermi energy of electrons inside a metal. You see, you have copper, a copper wire. A copper wire is a, met is a metal, there are conduction electrons and they have a certain Fermi energy. The star that is in the outer expanse of the universe is just like a metal. It's just like a sea of electrons which are obeying the Pauli exclusion principle and they have a very high Fermi energy. And the Fermi energy is given by this expression which we've derived the previous day. Now given this Fermi energy, we can calculate the average energy and the average energy would be given by E times the density of states GE, DE going all the way from 0 to EF and you divide it for normalization by GE DE from 0 to EF. So this is the average energy of electrons where G is the density of states and the average energy turns out to be if you perform this calculation is 3 over 5 times EF. So what this means is that if you have a band so electrons in a metal exist in a band, electrons in a star also exist in a band. And this band goes from 0 to EF and there is a particular density of states which is proportional to the square root of the energy, another relationship we derived the other day, then the average energy lies somewhere here, 3 over 5 times EF. And I can ask the derivation in the exam, so this is something that you need to do on your own. So this is the average energy of an electron. Now what is the total energy, the total electronic energy? If this is the average energy, how do you find the total energy? Multiply average with, Multiply average with what? Total with, with the total number of electrons. So this is U average times the total number of electrons is now capital NE. It's not NE 
per unit volume. It's the total number of electrons. So this is the total energy of the electrons in the star. You get 3 over 5 EF times NE. Now EF is H bar squared 2ME 3 pi squared 2 over 3 capital NE 2 by 3 capital NE 5 by 3 divided by the volume raised power 2 by 3. This is the total electronic energy. So if you look at this expression, higher, smaller the volume, smaller the volume of the star of the stellar corpse after it has burnt out its fuel, higher will be the electronic energy. This is making perfect sense. If you try to compress matter, if you try to compress a star, its electronic energy goes up. Which means that there is an outward pressure or a resistance to shrinking. So gravity tries to shrink, but the electronic energy or the Fermi energy tries to resist the shrinking. And so the stellar corpse settles to a particular radius. Now how do we find that radius? So the final object that is formed after the star has burnt out all its fuel, the final object that is formed is called a white dwarf. So what we really want to do is now to find out the radius of the white dwarf. How large is the white dwarf? So we've calculated the electronic energy. Now what we would like to do is calculate the gravitational potential energy. Today is going to be my most, the, the most difficult class to teach because of time constraints. So, it's a very difficult task to cover astrophysics in one lecture. guest lectures. So calculating the gravitational energy, potential energy. <laughs> now suppose you have a star. mass m of radius r and you have a small speck of dust a small speck of dust that is falling into the star and coalescing with the star and making up the stellar matter so how is the star formed the star is formed by having some core and and some matter outside and gravity pulls this matter into the star and this matter sticks into the star and keeps on building the stellar material. Suppose this small mass is dm. Alright, now let's assume that the gravitational potential energy of this, what is the gravitational potential energy of this star, of this material when it is at infinity? Zero u of dm at infinity is 0. What is u of this small piece of material at the radius r? When you bring this material onto the surface of the partially formed star, this is a partially constructed star. Look, we are talking about how big we are talking about, 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 how big we are talking speck of dust and we are bringing it onto the surface of a partially formed star so that we build up material on the star. So this is the power of physics. Just on a blackboard we can model universal scale phenomena. That's what we are doing. So when we bring this speck of dust onto the surface of the star, what is the potential energy of this speck of dust? Minus G 
एम डी एम ओवर आर दिस इज द पोटेंशियल एनर्जी सो माइनस ऑफ कोर्स यू विल हैव अ माइनस यू डी एम इंफिनिटी हेयर एज वेल बिकॉज पोटेंशियल एनर्जी इज जस्ट विद रिस्पेक्ट टू रेफरेंस दिस इज जीरो वी कैन इग्नोर इट एनी वेज so this is the potential energy associated with a speck of dust so how do you calculate the total poten gravitational potential energy of the star what you would do you would take d u d m r right and integrate this from 0 to the radius of this of the star which is capital r this is how you are constructing the star and this would simply be minus g m d m r 0 to capital r agreed but this mass depends upon radius this star will not have the same density throughout the star will have a higher density at the center and it will have as you go away from the center the density of the star is decreasing okay so all right this means that if you increase the radius if you increase the radius you bring in more matter and it falls onto the star the radius goes in the radius keeps on increasing right so when you keep on bringing matter from the surroundings and you deposit the material onto the surface of the star the radius goes on increasing so this mass keeps on increasing but this mass is now dependent upon the radius so this mass is dependent upon the radius as well and dm will simply be equal to density which is a function of the radius times dv and what is dv dv is 4 pi r squared so rho r r squared dr which means i can write this expression as minus g going from 0 to capital r m is now a function of r dm is simply 4 pi rho which is a function of r r squared dr and i have small r here so the gravitational potential energy equals minus g i can take 4 pi outside the integral 0 to capital r m of r rho r r dr any confusion up till so far theek hai humne kya kiya humne this mass depends upon the radius because as the radius grows the mass of the star will change and this dm is simply the density times the change in volume now the density is depends upon the density depends upon the radius and the volume is given by 4 pi r square dr so i just insert these values into here and i achieve this gravitational potential energy no i have to solve this integral in order to solve this integral i need to know what the density is at a particular radius so i there are models for there are curve fits for the density of stars with respect to radius how does the density vary the general rule is that the density is maximum at the center rho is maximum at rho at the center rho c and at the surface the density goes to zero so i can assume a model a realistic model that is what happens to the density with respect to r this is a model in astrophysics you always have these models as radius goes up the density drops to zero and so the model is that the density drops to zero linearly this is the simplest model that we can think of this is our model 
so at the radius capital R which is the radius of the white dwarf the density goes to 0 and at radius 0 the density is rho c so can you write an equation for this line please write an equation for this line देखो डेंसिटी एट द सेंटर ऑफ द स्टार मैक्सिमम है सब ज्यादा प्रेशर सेंटर पे है ना सरफेस ऑफ स्टार पे डेंसिटी जीरो है तो उन दोनों के दरमियान इंटरपोलेट करना है तो ये सिंपलेस्ट मॉडल है कि वेरीज लीनियरली सर जब आप कह रहे हैं कि डेंसिटी जो है वो मैस और वॉल्यूम है जहां उसका रेडियस बढ़ा रहे हैं इसके लिए हम उसका वॉल्यूम बढ़ा रहे हैं मास भी बढ़ा रहे हैं उसके साथ मैस भी बढ़ रहा है तो सभी लोग किस तरह कह सकते हैं कि वो डेंसिटी जीरो हो रही है स्टार के बिल्कुल बाहर चले जाओ कोई मास नहीं होगा उसका बाउंड्री कंडीशन का शाबाश बट ठीक है बिल्कुल ठीक है फाइन परफेक्ट smaller all right so this was easy rho as a function of r is given by rho c 1 minus small r over capital r when r is 0 this is rho c when r is capital r this is 0 so this is an equation for this model i can now insert this into here minus g 4 pi 0 to r m of r rho c 1 minus small r over capital R r dr now can I find rho c if I know the total mass of the star can I find the density at the center can you write an expression for that? Okay, the physics to explain stars is extremely simple. Extremely simple, provided you know what the Pauli student principle tells you. The question, the question is if I know the total mass of the white dwarf or the star, what is rho c? What's the density at the center? They are from the decay of a decay of a neutron. Okay. Actually, when the neutron decays, neutron का 12 minute का एक decay time होता है, life time होती है, उसमें वो decay कर जाता है. तो उससे neutrino बनता है. I will have to check this. Capital R is any... Uh, Capital R is the total radius. Total radius and then what? Isn't it smaller the radius of the object? Of the star? But you are making, constantly making the star. So the final okay. you settle up to Capital so R. Which is mass over 4 over pi r cube. Integral to 4 pi r square dr.
so the total mass of the star of the white dwarf capital M is rho dv right going from 0 to capital R this is a function of small r now rho r is pc rho c 1 minus r over capital R dv is 4 pi r squared dr going from 0 to capital R you equate this with the total mass and you'll be able to find out what rho c is and rho c which is the density at the center if you perform this calculation is equal to 3 times the total mass divided by pi and the radius cube of course smaller the radius higher will be the density at the center so now we have an expression for rho c what about mr can we calculate what mr is once again we perform this calculation rho r dv which is 4 pi r squared dr let's replace the r by r dash and we integrate from 0 to r once again we have rho c we know the value of rho c which is 3m pi r cube 4 pi 1 minus r dash over r r dash square dr dash going from 0 to capital small r and this turns out to be 4 over 3 pi rho c is 3 m pi r cube r cube 1 minus 3 r 4 capital R. So these are simple straightforward integrals. You just need to th think properly. So this is the total mass of the sun. The total mass of the, of the star of course is given by density times the volume where you integrate from 0 to the total radius. Assuming this linear model for the density and the mass of a partially formed star at radius R is the same expression only difference is that you integrate up to the radius of interest now we have the expression for MR we have the expression for the density as a function of R and we can find what the gravitational potential energy is the gravitational potential energy is simply found out by putting in all of these values minus capital G 4 pi 0 to capital R MR is given by this expression 4 over 3 pi 3 capital M pi R cube small r cube 1 minus 3 R over 4 capital R and then you have rho R rho R is given by rho C 1 minus small r over capital R then you have another r square dr and you integrate from 0 to capital R this will give you the total gravitational potential energy of the star. So there are several constants and there are three terms that depend upon small r. You can perform this integration quite easily. And the result is minus 26 over 35 capital G m square over r. So now we have a gravitational potential energy and we have an electronic potential energy.
please be patient you're going to get some very nice results now this is the gravitational potential energy first question capital M is fixed what is capital M capital M is the mass of the star that has burnt out all its fuel agreed now what is the mass of such a star what would this star comprise of hydrogen no it would comprise of helium so this mass capital M is the number of helium atoms multiplied by the mass of each helium atom and the mass of each helium atom is the it has two protons two neutrons suppose the neutrons have the same mass as the protons so you write the mass of the proton times 4 because there are two protons two neutrons which makes approximately 4 protons and electrons have a very small mass as compared to the protons and the neutrons so they can be neglected okay so this is the total mass of the helium atom of the of the sun of this of the star which has burnt out all its fuel and it only comprises helium now now how many electrons would there be in such a star how many electrons are in a single helium atom there are two electrons in a helium atom so the number of electrons will be given by the number of helium atoms times 2 2 times num m over 4 mp which is the mass of the star divided by 2 times the mass of the proton this is the number of electrons in the star that has burnt out all its fuel now if you look at the gravitational potential energy can you plot this potential energy on this curve please plot this potential energy don't forget about the magnitudes of these values but plot this potential energy on this curve pehle plot karo phir jawab dunga टिक एनर्जी है जब हम इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इन अ बॉक्स लेते हैं विरियल थेरम है जिसे कहते हैं कि पोटेंशियल एनर्जी अगर दी हो तो कैनेटिक एनर्जी आप फाइंड कर सकते हैं जो कि हाफ होती है ठीक है ना और फिर आप टोटल एनर्जी यूज करें ठीक है आई टू थिंक अबाउट दिस एनी वन हैज मेड द प्लॉट ओके गुड प्लॉट बनाओ प्लॉट बनाओ जल्दी बनाओ पॉजिटिव है नेगेटिव है पॉजिटिव है कि नेगेटिव है नेगेटिव यू होगा सर ठीक है ना तो बनाते क्यों नहीं सर एक्चुअली वो ग्रेडियंट का थोड़ा सा ये माइनस साइन है तो मैं वन ओवर आ रहा है ना हाइपरबोलिक होगा 
all right so the gravitational potential energy goes like this and as you can well imagine the lowest energy state as far as gravity is concerned is that the star shrinks completely but if you look at this expression as the volume decreases the electronic energy the electronic energy goes up so we can plot express this volume in terms of radius as well so volume is given by 4 over 3 pi r cube and what do we have over there we have volume raised to power 2 by 3 so volume raised to the power 2 by 3 will give you 4 over 3 pi raised to power 2 by 3 r squared so we can replace this expression for the volume and express it in terms of the radius r and what do we get here we get the electronic energy can you repeat what is written here please so that I can ue equals 3 by 5 over 2 times mass of electron 3 pi square raised to power 2 by 3 n e raised to power 5 by 3 ok which means <coughs> 3 over 4 pi raised power 2 by 3 1 over r squared now this is the electronic energy whereas this is the gravitational potential energy can you plot the electronic energy on the same scale Just, just try to plot, plot the function, the electronic energy. Slopes will be the same or the sleepover. All right. So this gives you a positive contribution to the total energy. It's positive and as R goes up the electronic energy goes up so this is the electronic energy associated with the Pauli exclusion principle and this is the gravitational potential energy so the total energy will be the sum of these two and this has a much steeper slope so now you can very well recognize that as the star is shrinking after it has burnt out its fuel gravity would like it to shrink it to a P gravity would like it to shrink it to a point matter ke dhane ke barabar ho jaye gravity ka ye kaam hai itna shrink kar do kyunki that is energetically favorable as far as gravity only is concerned but now we have electrons in the star and the electrons have a fermi energy which comes out because of the Pauli exclusion principle and that is making the star incompressible so it, you can compress it only to a certain limit because as you keep on compressing the star the fermi energy goes up or the electronic energy goes up because the concentration or the density of electrons is increasing you are squeezing the electrons closer and closer together and this is reminiscent of our discussion on the uncertainty principle as well so now when you squeeze the electrons inside this stellar corpse and you take the total energy the total energy curve will have a minimum this is the total energy curve u total it's the electronic and part plus the gravitational part and how do you find this minimum 
you find the total energy ut which is ue plus ug and you differentiate it with respect to what do you differentiate with respect to r equated to zero and solve for r so the result after solving this for r turns out to be approximately So there is an equilibrium length. Just like two atoms approaching one to uh, head on, there is an equilibrium bond length. There is an equilibrium, look, very important point, uh, please pay attention. There is an equilibrium distance, an equilibrium radius at which the energy is minimized. So after the star has burned out all its fuel, gravity is trying to squeeze the star. The degeneracy pressure is trying to resist that squeezing. At a certain value of the radius, which I am denoting here as R equilibrium, will the two pressures exactly balance one another and the stellar corpse will settle to a radius to this R equilibrium. And this R equilibrium is just found out by differentiating the total energy with respect to zero. Okay? Or uski when you perform all the calculations you see everything is known when you perform all the calculations and you should do this calculation I cannot do it in the class because it will take up all of the time you would arrive at this result where this M sub solar is a convenient constant in astronomy and it is the solar mass the mass of our sun the mass of our sun so you compare the mass of the star with the mass of the sun, right? And this is the final expression that you get. Now you notice a very strange result. Higher the mass, smaller will be the radius. Higher the mass, smaller will be the radius. This defies common sense because in normal stars, higher the mass, generally the radius is higher. However, in a white dwarf, which is the final settling form of such a star, higher the mass, smaller will be the radius. And that is because higher mass means a higher gravitational potential energy. Therefore, gravitational potential energy is dominant and only at a very small radius with the degeneracy pressure come up to a level so as to resist the on onslaught of gravity. So smaller mass gives you a higher radius and in fact this calculation is borne out by experimental data. For example the first white dwarf, one of the first white dwarfs that was discovered is called Sirius B. So there are two stars on the sky. The brightest star that is observable from Pakistan on a night sky, the brightest object that you can see in the sky after the moon is the star called Sirius A. It's a large star. It's a large star. But when astronomers looked at this star, they, look, they observed a wobbly motion of this star. They observed a wobbly motion of this star. And they predicted that there must be a nearby star which is not luminous, which is not easily observable, for example, with the naked eye. This can be seen with the naked eye. But there has to be a massive star which 
can have, which could not be very luminous, but very massive. And it's not luminous because it has a small radius and it is affecting the motion of Sirius A. So they discovered that this is in fact a white dwarf. And the radius of this white dwarf exactly matches this prediction because the mass of Sirius B is about 1.05 times the solar mass. It's a convenient unit to remember. The solar mass is about 2 into 10 to 30 kilogram. So, this is an example of a white dwarf. In fact, Sirius is such a prominent star that it's even mentioned in the Quran because it's so easily observable. It's called Shera. Surah Najm. All right, so this is the summary of what the summary for white dwarfs is that after a star has quenched all its fuel, after all the fuel has been dissipated, all the fuel has gone, the gravity would like to take over the star, comes into the driving seat and tries to squeeze the star, but it cannot keep on squeezing the star infinitely. What happens is that the degeneracy pressure, which is because of the Fermi energy of the electrons, because of the Pauli exclusion principle, it is resisting the squeezing of the star. And finally, the, star, the stellar corpse settles onto a radius which is given by this expression. And what have we used to derive this expression? Simple mechanics, simple mechanics, and the Pauli exclusion principle, nothing else. So the simple rules, simple laws of the nature, quantum mechanics, simple laws, Pauli exclusion principle, mechanics that determine the fate of such large objects such as stars and white dwarfs. However, let's move on. The story does not end here. What if, what if the stars, here we are assuming a certain mass of the star. What if the star is so heavy? What if the star is extremely heavy? There is a limit, there is a maximum mass of white dwarfs as well. What if the star is extremely heavy? You see, this expression that we derived for the energy of an electron trapped inside a well, deco, is pi square h bar squared 2 m l squared n x squared plus n y squared plus n z squared, right? This is, was our starting point for the calculation of the Fermi energy, correct? particle in a well and this assumes that the energy of the electron is much smaller than the rest mass energy of the electron m naught c squared yes that is we are using a non relativistic expression for the energy what if the mass of the star is so high that when gravity squeezes onto the star the kinetic energy of the star goes so high and the temperature goes so high that the thermal motion of the electrons start moving at very high speeds. And when electrons start moving at very high speeds, then in the extreme case, their, their mass, their energies could approach the rest mass energy of the electrons. And this is called the extreme relativistic case. In the extreme relativistic case, the electrons start behaving like photons because the energy of any electron as you recall is given by Pc squared plus m naught c squared squared under root. So if this term starts dominating, that is the momentum of the electrons goes so high that it overcomes the rest mass energy of the electron then E will approximately given by PC. Then we could not use this expression for the energy. 
because this expression is in fact p squared over 2m it's just the kinetic energy of the electron but we have to use a relativistic expression for the energy so if the mass exceeds a certain threshold value then you can have objects that even have a smaller radius than the white dwarf okay so the limit of such a mass m is called m chandrasekhar named after an indian young physicist who made this calculation in his phd thesis is about 30 years old so m chandrasekhar is about 1.4 times the solar mass so what happens if the mass of a star the starting mass of a star is greater than the chandrasekhar mass then the electrons cannot the degeneration the degeneracy pressure of the electrons cannot resist the star from collapsing so there is a white dwarf has a radius r equilibrium but if the mass exceeds the chandrasekhar mass the mass the starting mass is higher than the chandrasekhar mass then you can have an object which is which has a smaller radius than this equilibrium radius of a white dwarf and what happens there you the electrons are trying to resist the onslaught of gravity but if the mass is so high that you have to use a relativistic expression then the electrons are squeezed so close to one another that the electrons combine with the protons to form neutrons electrons get so close to the protons that a reaction occurs in which an electron combines with a proton to form a neutron and a neutrino now the neutrinos are very light particles they do not interact with mat matter so the neutrinos escape the neutrinos all escape and what you are left with is just a ball of neutrons so if the mass exceeds the chandrasekhar limit you can go to smaller radii than the radius of a white dwarf and you will end up with an object which is called a neutron star and the neutron star is only a ball of neutrons the no electrons the no protons in a neutron star it's only that at the crust of the neutron star at the crust of the neutron star there is a small layer of material which generally has iron in it because of the nuclear reactions and iron makes this neutron star magnetic and how do you detect these neutron stars you see when the radius is shrinking when the radius is shrinking what what should happen to the moment of inertia moment of inertia ko kya hoga decrease hoga lekin you have to conserve angular momentum so when the moment of inertia is decreasing what is happening to the angular momentum it must conserve the angular momentum must conserve what must increase angular the angular frequency so as this star is shrinking the basic laws of mechanics are describing these exotic phenomena as the star is shrinking it forms a white dwarf and if the mass is so large that it can go beyond the it can go even smaller than the white dwarf then as its radius shrinks its moment of inertia shrinks but angular momentum has to be conserved so it starts moving at very high angular frequencies very high angular frequencies bahut tezi ke sath yun ghumta bahut tezi ke sath 
it starts, its angular velocity goes up. Very rapidly. And since the crust is iron, since the crust is iron, now you have a, mag you have a mag magnetic material or a magnetic dipole which has a north pole and a south pole. See, you see, it's just like a magnet. This is like a magnet. It has a north pole and a south pole. This is planet. This is the magnetism of a neutron star. So it's a magnetic object or a magnetic dipole which is rotating at a very high frequency. What will it do? It will produce electromagnetic waves. And if you're sitting on the earth and observing at a neutron star after a certain period of time, which corresponds to the angular frequency, you will observe a burst of radiation. So if you, are, you have the time axis here, you will observe a burst of radiation. And this period will simply be 2 pi over omega. Because it's directional radiation hai. and when you're observing it, there are it, the radiation, it is a highly directed burst of radiation. And when you're observing it, there is only a certain window of time when you can observe it. So this neutron, this is how you discover neutron stars. And there are many neutron stars that have now been discovered. And that is why such a neutron star is also called a pulsar. And it is a very high magnetic field in mega teslas. So such a neutron star is called a pulsar. Agar jo log, jo mere dost Karachi mein rehte hain, they must have seen lighthouses. So if you are on the surface of, if you are on Clifton and you have a lighthouse that is nearby and the light, the light of the lighthouse is revolving, you will observe the beam after periodic intervals. So these neutron stars are the lighthouses of the universe. Now what stops the neutron star from shrinking? What are neutrons? Are they fermions? No, no, no. Neutrons are fermions. Neutrons are also fermions, just like electrons. So they also obey the Pauli exclusion principle. The only difference is that instead of the mass of the electron, you have to use the mass of the neutron. And the mass of the neutron is much higher than the mass of the electron, about 2000 times higher. Therefore, the Fermi energy associated with the neutrons is much smaller. Which means that eventually the neutron star will also settle to a particular radius. Given by the mass of the neutron. Because the Fermi energy, the, elect the neutronic energy is much smaller than the electronic energy. So neutron stars have a smaller equilibrium radius than the white dwarfs. But again, Pauli exclusion principle is at play. It is the Pauli exclusion principle applied to neutrons which prevent the further collapse of neutron stars. All right. And the last thing, if the mass is so large, if the mass is so large that even the Pauli exclusion principle applied to the neutrons finally yields in, break then you form what are called black holes which are the most exotic objects in the universe but the key concept is that using simple laws of quantum mechanics you can not only explain metals semiconductors the hydrogen atom all of the elements in the periodic table diodes transistors but you can also describe some of the most majestic objects in the universe. So we had a very nice time over the past three or four months. I thank you all for being my students and I wish you best of luck for your final exams. Thank you.